Welcome to Reconciliation Roundtable, a new podcast where we discuss building bridges of understanding across religious and political difference. I'm your host, Mark Beckwith, retired Bishop of the Diocese of Newark in the Episcopal Church. There are forces and voices in our increasingly polarized world that want us to view each other in the issues of the day in a binary way, this or that, good or bad. I want to invite you on a journey beyond the safety of our silos and our egos to the soul, where we have the opportunity to see things differently. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find more content like this, please visit my website at www.markbeckwith.net, where you can listen to more episodes, read my weekly blog, and sign up to get weekly reflections in your inbox. I also explore the themes of this podcast further in my book, Seeing the Unseen, Beyond Prejudices, Paradigms, and Party Lines. With me today is Pastor Gil Monrose, who's the pastor of Mount Zion Church of God, Seventh-day Church in Brooklyn, the founder of Clergy for Safe Cities, the executive director of faith-based and community partnerships in the city of New York, working very closely with Mayor Adams. Pastor, it's great to have you with us today and to hear about your journey to where you are now and how your commitments, your faith has informed your extensive ministry, not just in New York City, but around the country. And that's been a part of your life from the beginning, has it not? Oh, yeah. Um, Faith is a very important part. Normally, you know, when you have immigrants move into the the U.S. via the Caribbean, one of the things that they have to hold there to is their fate. So fate has always been very important for our family. And so I've always walked with it ever since as a child. And you grew up in the Virgin Islands in the church. And how yeah. old were you when you came here? I left, unfortunately, the American paradise, as we are called. And I came in 2000. So I don't know how old that was, but it's probably like 24, 25 or something like that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you came to Brooklyn. Yeah. And became part of a faith community there. Had you already been ordained or did you do your ministry training in the mainland of the United States as opposed to the Virgin Islands? You know, I held just about every position except ordained position in the Virgin Islands, you know, throughout the years, guitar player, bass player, drummer, keyboard player, choir director, worship leader, you know, youth leader. So I had all of these experiences. And so when I came, I just basically hone in and polish the skills by attending Nyack College. Mm-hmm. And then graduating from that college and then going into uh, ministry, being ordained in 2005. And I've been growing since then. This will be my 19th year pastoring. And the seminary you graduated from, you just told me that they're going to offer you a doctorate, an honorary doctorate, and you're going to be the commencement speaker. So clearly you've lived into the full passion of, of your ministry. Yeah, it's a blessing. Thank God. When you look back over, you, you kind of wonder, realize, ooh, this was really a marvelous journey that we continue to go on to see how coming from the Virgin Islands, being fired from my second job that I had in New York City, then moving on to creating every other job that I've ever had since then, getting to this point in this place, and then coming back full circle to the same university who... When I asked them to organize a alumni club, they was like, no, nah, we can't do that. To be, you know, the commencement speaker and an honorary doctorate, that is full circle, my friend. If anything is a circle, it is that. <laughs> yeah. And growing up in the Virgin Islands, if I remember correctly, your father was, was a pastor. Correct. Yeah. So exactly. you grew up in, in the church. How did that experience of moving from one culture, as you say, the paradise of the Virgin Islands to the much colder climate of New York City in many different ways. How did that affect your faith and your spiritual journey? Yeah, it it made me believe more because I said, if it's this cold, wow, I don't want to see how hot it is in hell. But, (laughs) (laughs) But 
I I think it's very helpful in moving from small islands to big cities because it tests your faith. It shifts you into a place where sometimes you realize what you didn't have and you were still faithful. And when you do have or you do get coming to the big life, the more affluent things, and you can still keep your faith, it's, it's a real testament to your upbringing. Mm-hmm. So shifting and moving, of course, you have to get adjusted. You have to get assimilated to it. You have to learn cultures. You have to learn, learn how to navigate through. You have to learn the rhythm of America. You have to know where you're placed. So you have to figure all of this in a short space of time. Mm. So being able to do it and still keep your faith and not be dazzled by the brightness of the lights of the city, being able to, quote, unquote, not take a bite out of the apple. Mm-hmm. It lends to... The fact that your upbringing plays a very major role mm-hmm. in, in securing your, your faith in big cities like New York. Sure. In that transition from the Virgin Islands to New York, is there anything that stands out as the most difficult challenge in adapting to this new life and holding on to the faith that was so much a part of you growing up? Yeah, the difficult challenge is the fast-paced cultural differences in style of even saying good morning and good afternoon, mm-hmm. saying hi to people, having to learn that too. So normally when I go into rooms, just came from an event today, I was like, hey, how was everyone doing? Hi. It was like, oh my goodness, you're so friendly. Uh, but, well, this is what we had to do. This was not being friendly. If you didn't say hi, good afternoon, good morning, that's a high level of respect that would get you a spanking from your parents. Mm-hmm. And so Culturally, in terms of just the American society, you know, had to take some learning. Mm -hmm. And listen, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to learn and grow. Sure. And still be able to move within society as well. So you had these challenges as you were also making this transition. Was there anything that stood out that made it easier, that lifted you up, offered support as you were uh, adjusting to this new culture? In this new climate? Um, yeah, I think we we had a very good support system. Mm. And so that stood out for us very much. So for me, I have family members who grew up, who were born in New York City and accepted me in. And so that stood out to me for sure, is having great family members who are actually here, living in New York City. Sure. So in the 20 years that you've been here, or longer than that, actually, how has your faith grown or been challenged or changed in that time? All three. Mm. Change, challenge, you know, remain. Faith in thinking about how humanity can have a country that is racist. Challenge, you know, from a standpoint of being true to people, mm-hmm. loving people, not because of the color of the skin, but because of the context of the character being able to see the injustices and still have faith in humanity. So we will always push the poverty levels, dealing with this, the divestment from communities of color, failing schools, violence, all those things challenge you, challenge your, your faith and your ideal as to how could you be faithfully present in communities to be able to give some idea of love, companionship, compassion, justice, mercy, in the midst of all of those who have been left on the margins, left out, left behind. And so it it has challenged and it has remained. You got to remain steadfast that God actually brought you into a particular city to be helpful to the city. Were the challenges that you experienced here in New York different than the challenges in the Virgin Islands, particularly around disinvestment and around race? Yes, there is there is driplets of that. Just for some reason, every society, for the most part, always dwell in the gray areas of classism and those who have, those who don't have. I think Jesus reminded us time and time again that those who is not sick need not a physician. But he said that the poor we'll always have among us. And even from then, we know that there's these classes, those who are, you know, had money and who really that God was in in the things and he he continued to warn us that you don't stop your treasure 
where anyone can break in, but store up your treasure in the heavenly realm. So it's something that we continue to work, continue to develop, we continue to build around those things. We continue to challenge ourselves to make it the best that we can so that all the things that we experience, that we don't become what we despise. Mm. Wow, an incredible journey and transition into this new culture. And one of the things in the way we got to know each other is through your commitment and your extensive work in dealing with the scourge of gun violence. How did that commitment take root in you? It met me. It met me at the front door of my church. And so having people who you have to practically see dead on the ground, how do you live a life without trying to push against a narrative that brings to bear death and destruction? How do you change the mindset of an individual to be able to love themselves so much that they see the image of God in them, mm -hmm. even though society thinks differently? Mm -hmm. I think because we are poised on hope and poised on the fact that there is opportunities to be able to grow and to be godlike led me to figure out, can I be helpful in this challenge and this fight that is faced before us that we can save young people who probably don't want to save themselves, to have them love themselves, even though they feel unlovable, and that everyone have value, you know, in society and God loves all of us. So that's how I got to the work. It met me at the front of my church where a young man was shot and that they changed my life forever. Mm. As you've been involved in this and been a leader, indeed a national leader, in gathering faith communities together, what have you learned? Well, faith leaders want to do more, but there needs to be a realization that sometimes we don't know everything. And we have to be honest with ourselves that if we have people that can show us and we can glean from, then I think it's important to grab hold of them. And so what I've learned and what I've done and what I've seen and experienced is that leaders will work with you if they feel that you're genuine, and if you actually have answers to the questions that they need or resources to what they need. Mm -hmm. So our journey to be able to be engaging in recruiting, organizing, supporting, loving faith leaders have been one of understanding how to grow in community, but also uh, having the skill set and the tools and the experience to be able to say, hey, I, I've been there, done that, and hopefully they will take you up on the word that you're doing. It's just because of the love of your heart. And as you've been engaged in this work of reaching out to families, offering funerals, teaching young people that they are of value to God, even though they may not feel that themselves, and yet deaths keep happening, how do you maintain your commitment? What keeps you going in this very difficult work? Life keeps me going, knowing that my son and my daughter have to walk the same street just as everyone else. I, I want them to be safe just like I want your son and your daughter to be able to walk home from school safe. I want to be able to have my wife be able to enjoy the community in the neighborhood, take a run without being fearful of their lives. So it's a personal challenge for me to make sure that my family's safe. And so if I can make sure that my family's safe, we'll make sure that all of your families are safe at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, and you've gathered people together in New York City and around the country and have been identified over and over again, certainly by the mayor of New York City, but others, pastors around the country as a significant leader. How does that leadership inform your faith and be informed by your faith? It is everything. Like I said, it's your bedrock. I mean, the beauty about also to work in and dealing with a complex group of diversity of faith leaders and faith traditions is that first you have to know who you are. And I tell people that the reason that I can get along with you is because I know who I am. I'm a Christian individual who believe in the holistic of the gospel, where the gospel has to be moving and breathing in community, moving and breathing in issues. And therefore, since I know who I am and what I believe in, it makes it easier for me to accept and work with others because they're different. And I want to be included. I want to be invited. And I understand that once we can do good work here on this side of heaven, that's what God called us for, to mm -hmm. be able to live peaceably with all men, regardless of religion, creed, color, gender, whatever the case is. So I have really worked to figure out and work with individuals uh, because I know who I am. And because I know who I am, it makes our job very easy. 
your tradition is somewhat unique in this fast-paced world, particularly in New York City, where once a week you take a Sabbath day. That is foundational to your tradition. Hallelujah. <laughs> and <laughs> you unplug, do you not? It's sundown on Friday and oh, yes. plug in on sundown on Saturday. How has that formed you, framed you, led you, guided you? It is one of the most amazing doctrinal truths that we hold to be there to us. It is not only our identity, but it is our life to be able to break for 24 hours, to reset, to refocus, to refresh, to reorganize, to relive the experience of just resting, you know, in solidarity of the outside influence of the world. I think it's helped me. I think it makes me look younger because I have a restful day at a time once a week and with busy schedules. Normally people take sabbaticals. That's the idea of a Sabbath. Sabbatical is a break from doing what you would normally be doing and doing something else, just as the Sabbath rest is a break. And that break is that God says, I want to create space between all the things that you're doing and just focus on me. So we have a 24 hour moment where we rest, we reflect, we worship, we fellowship together, we eat together, mm -hmm. and uh, we love one another for that 24 hours. Mm -hmm. What are some of the uh, key things that happen on a Sabbath day for you that continues to inspire your intention and your commitment to live this rhythm of life? Yeah, no phone calls. <laughs> Not taking any, no Zooms. Don't really have to worry about the outside influence and the world and schedules. That's empowering. It, it empowers you. It gives you the idea that the world can be out there going hell to skelter crazy. And you're just saying, hey, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pause. Mm -hmm. Samuel Bakioki, one of the teachers in the Sabbath Keeping Movement, he wrote a book called Rest for Human Restlessness. And so it's an idea that we're taking a break. We're coming to a place where we can just bask. And so that's an awesome opportunity for all of you to try. If not once a week, at least once a month. And you spent a, a goodly bit of your time in the mayor's office. And you've been close to the mayor. You've known him for a long time. I could imagine on Sabbath days, he will uh, give you a phone call, but knows that he can't reach you. How do you keep a balance? in your ministry of working with the church and working in the mayor's office? It's, it's one of the same. It's just like any bivocational individuals. But the work that we do is around the faith community. And it's just like, take, for instance, if I have to attend a meeting, what I do in terms of organizing faith communities, and I need to attend a meeting from, from my local church, basically it's the same meeting. Like yesterday we did something around food pantries, and so we have a food pantry too. So that'll be the meeting that I would be interested in. That's the meeting that I'm planning. You have situations where you need to work on migrants and the homeless shelter, gun violence. This is what I would normally attend if I was a pastor. So the work that we do, it overlaps between the two roles, working in city government and also working, of course, within a church structure. There are some nuances where you go a little further in your faith tradition and faith belief outside of your work. But in terms of the tenets of how we operate and what we do, it's the same space that I would be in mm -hmm. regards of if, if even if I was leading or if I was the pastor of the, the church. And my guess is in all the places where you are involved, your faith comes along with you. Are there any moments where you feel like you have to sort of turn that off in terms of your communication? In some spaces, yeah, definitely for sure more accommodating, more open to what is happening in society. When you go into your church community, it's more specific to the set of beliefs that drives you to why you come every weekend, as opposed to loving, supporting, cherishing everyone in a cross-section of individuals. So in the work you do in New York City, in the mayor's offices, faith-based and community partnerships, 
New York is a very large, diverse stew of different religions. Oh, you know. How does that work with the interfaith community inform your own Christian faith and practice? I think what I said to you before is the first thing that I work on is understanding, you know, who I am and what I believe. And that gives me the encouragement to understand that the other person is different from me. That's why I have to love them and work with them. And so when we understand exactly where we are coming from, it gives you a truer sense of mutual respect for the person because you understand that the reason that you're respecting them is because you are different. The reason that you're respecting them is because, you know, you fundamentally disagree with some of their beliefs when it comes to the spiritual aspect of your life. And so you offer a olive branch of mutual respect for those individuals. And so that's how we try to do here. So as I move around into the different traditions, different religions, different movement, different sects, different orders, I'm going in there with an understanding that I am open to what you have to share to humanity. Yet still, the reason that I'm not you is because I have my own set and ideals of belief. But I am open enough to understand that the God that I serve gives me the opportunity to be able to say, listen, we can definitely work and love together. Mm -hmm. Have you learned from these other traditions that are different from you? What, what sort of things have you learned? Lots of things. Discipline, mm -hmm. commitment to their faith traditions and their beliefs, specific prayers, and the commitment to praying in the public space in terms of organizing and the timeline. Learn a, a lot, just being able to be true to the calling of your belief. Mm -hmm. And so that's the beauty of seeing all of this, you know? So it must be exciting to be able to venture into different spaces and to learn to develop relationships and through this mutual respect to come to a deeper understanding of possibilities of working together. Yeah, it, it gives you that idea that you have to work together. There needs to be mutual respect because that's the way that you can live among each other. What happened even during segregation racism was that people always thought that they were better than another race because of their religion, their color, the creed, whatever the case is. And that's why you find in even these organized religious activities or historical events, people was killed in the name of righteousness, which we know that's not God have never appointed or to say that we need to kill anyone because of X, Y, Z. So it's the idea of love, community, bringing together, understanding differences and working from where you can together to have a better society. Well, on that note, that really gives a vision for who you are, what your commitments have been and continue to be, and how your passion and desire to bring people together has brought you into the inner circle of the mayor of New York City and out beyond to all these clergy around the country. And so, Pastor Monros, I really appreciate this time that we've spent together and continue to spend together as we join our faith and our commitment to reduce the scourge of gun violence that affects so many of our communities. With me is Pastor Gil Monros of Mount Zion Church, Seventh Day in Brooklyn, New York, the executive officer at Faith-Based Community Partnerships in the Mayor's Office of New York City, and the founder and president of Clergy for Safe Cities. Gil, it's been great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Reconciliation Roundtable. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and visit markbeckwith.net to stay up to date with new episodes, blog content, and other news. Please, if you could, rate and review this podcast on iTunes. It helps new listeners to find us. 